Uh, hi guys, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm here to present findings from my thesis research on the Western chicken turtle. Uh, before we start, I'd like to thank my committee members and the institutions that have funded and supported my work for the last few years, Texas Parks and Wildlife, the Katy Prairie Conservancy, and the Natural Resources Institute. Uh, before we dive into the actual research, research sorry, um, I think we should start to, by kind of understanding our study organism. Um, chicken turtles are emitids, so similar in shape and size to our typical red-eared sliders, map turtles, and cooters but very different in their habits. Uh, they have these big yellow bars on their front legs. Um, they can range from kind of dull to bright. Uh, they can be really pretty. Uh, in Texas, they have this weird three-eyed smiley face pattern on the side. Um, <clears throat> they have super long necks and a modified hyoid so that they can use suction feeding to actually suck in their prey. Uh, they eat crawfish and other invertebrates and, and probably tadpoles and other things that are abundant in ephemeral wetlands. Um, they're pretty, there's a pretty wide uh, sexual size dimorphism. Here we have the smallest and largest mature males from our sites scaled with the smallest and largest mature females. So you can see that there's a big difference in size between an adult male and an adult female. Uh, chicken turtles like these shallow, gently sloping, heavily vegetated wetlands that dry up from time to time. And they do this weird thing where they leave the wetlands and wander around on land for a couple of reasons. Um, sometimes it's to go from one wetland to another, and sometimes it's to move to estivation sites on land, typically during drier periods. This is one adult male's movements over a year. When they estivate, they bury completely under the soil with no burrow cavity or tunnel. Um, the season that they estivate can be different regionally, and in Florida, they can be active any time of year. There are three subspecies, the Eastern, Western, and Florida chicken turtles, and genetic studies suggest a deep split between the Western chicken turtle and the other two subspecies. In spite of the fact that a lot of their ranges in Texas, there haven't been, to our knowledge, any targeted studies on chicken turtles in Texas, and a lot of other turtle studies within their range in Texas just haven't been capturing them. Typically in Texas, the way you find a chicken turtle is you see one crossing a road or a trail and you go, huh, a chicken turtle, where did it come from? Another thing to note about their range in Texas is that it's under major urbanization threat being so close to Houston, Dallas, and all the other towns in between. For those reasons, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has decided that listing the Western subspecies might be warranted. Our primary objectives were to develop survey protocols that answer important questions about dealing with this species in Texas, like where do we catch them, how do we catch them, and when do we catch them. Uh, the estivation season where they're underground varies regionally. Our second objective was to understand how they use space. In spatial ecology, we try to understand the distance and shape of animal movements. With the current urbanization threat, it might be prudent to target areas for protection that have enough space to support chicken turtle populations. But we so, know so little about we know so little about them in Texas um, that we had no idea how much they move around on land. Two of our field sites were at the uh, Katy Prairie Conservancy west of Houston, which is very convenient because our friends from Houston can come out and volunteer. But it's also strange because it's so close to town that the urban sprawl is imminent. You can see the dashed green line where the Katy Prairie used to extend. It can also be a little challenging because our two study sites are kind of at the edges of the property, um, which adds some interesting challenges I'll discuss when we get to the spatial ecology. We have another site in East Texas, in the East Texas Piney Woods um, that we don't have much spatial ecology data on, but we have quite a few marked turtles up there. Um, for our first objective to find out where, when, and how to catch them, uh, we used a lot of telemetry data from our spatial ecology study, along with a little bit of GPS tracking, camera monitoring, and then a bunch of field tests using a variety of capture methods. But we started with a literature review of all the different ways they'd captured chicken turtles in other areas. Um, so where should we survey? We know they like these densely vegetated ephemeral wetlands, but at what depth? Um, wetlands vary in depth, so it's important to know where to survey. By taking depth observations from all telemetry animals with more than 10 aquatic positions, we found that the population mean depth at Katy Prairie was about 14 inches, so pretty shallow. Uh, 
um, we didn't find a significant difference between adult and juvenile deaths, um, but we did for adult males and females. However, uh, we ran a nested ANOVA and found that if we removed this one outlying individual, um, there weren't significant differences. Um, that one spent a lot of time in a sort of unique wetland situation involving an er eroded irrigation canal. Um, but long story short, all of them seem to be using similar uh, water depths if they're in these natural prairie pothole wetlands. Uh, so how do we catch them? In prior studies, several methods were used, but in most of the foundational studies, they used these drift fences where they would make a big ring around the whole wetland and catch them when they're migrating out to estivate or, or nest um, or migrate to another wetland. Um, some studies have used aquatic traps, but it's important to note that in 2015, we used baited hoop nets ad nauseum at spots we now know have a lot of chicken turtles and didn't catch any until we tried unbaited fike nets. Um, and for some of the studies on, on the Western subspecies, um, they didn't publish uh, which traps specifically they were catching uh, individuals in. Um, they were using bait, but it was hard to tell from the publication um, if they had been in a baited hoop net or a fike net. Um, but I will say in every study that has tried using unbaited fike nets, um, they have been successful at catching them. Uh, the attraction of bait seems to maybe be region specific um, and, and the fikes are a more consistent choice. Uh, here's a typical fike trap for catching turtles. You have two turtle traps on the ends with uh, minosane in between acting like an underwater drift fence to guide them into the trap while they forage. Um, I also made some smaller fikes by running 10 feet of plastic over two ropes drawn between these smaller crawfish traps. Um, since capture rates are essentially sort of temporal waiting time quantities, uh, we used the Poisson comparison of, of rates rather than T-tests or uh, Mann-Whitney U-tests. Um, we caught about one chicken turtle for every four trap nights with fike nets. Um, we didn't do as well with the smaller fike nets, um, but the mesh size on them would also occasionally cause a mud snake to get tangled in the trap, um, which isn't good. Uh, so we kind of moved on to other ways to trap shallower, and they've observed this in Oklahoma uh, as well. Donald McKnight and Day Ligon uh, found that that sometimes these smaller mesh traps cause snake entanglement. Um, if you look at the at where the uh, we deployed fight traps, um, and we typically try to get them pretty shallow, you can see that we would probably benefit from modifying them to trap in shallower water. Uh, the blue line is the population mean depth, and the red line is the mean depth where we we deployed fike traps. And like I said, we try to get them as shallow as possible. Um, in 2020, we started using fike nets uh, with D-shaped rings to allow for shallower trapping. Um, we had some concern with uh, that with all that vegetation, maybe walking through to check traps might disturb the veg and deter future captures. Um, so we tried putting longer intervals between checks and the capture rate was actually higher when you go to them every day. Uh, so there may be some kind of escape factor where if you don't check them every day, they get out or something, but you can you can totally check them every day. Um, I recommend leaving traps in one spot for two nights and then moving them to another site. Our capture capture rate dropped by half after two nights. Um, for active surveys, we compared dip net surveys where you scoop up vegetation and feel around in it for turtles. Uh, wading surveys where you walk around after dusk with a headlamp and just look for turtles in the water at night and catch them by hand. Uh, sane surveys where two people drag a sane net across a wetland and scoop up anything in the trap, in that strip, I'm sorry, scoop up anything in that, that strip of the wetland. Um, and road surveys, which can be kind of sad. Um, we found turtles using all of, all of the methods, but dip netting had the highest capture rate and road surveys performed rather poorly. Um, I read this, this older book by Archie Carr, and I really liked this word attack because it makes me feel like I'm working with these guys um, trying to attack the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But I wanted to know, you know, is, is this true? Are we neglecting adult turtles by relying on sane surveys? And it turns out you might have been right. Um, this shows the proportion of captures by demographic. The uh, fight captures were fairly even demographically. 
uh, scenes, plastic fikes, and dip nets tend to capture juveniles, and, and hand captures tend to yield adult females, which all makes sense. A larger turtle would be more obvious on a visual weighting survey. Um, this is further supported when we look at the sizes captured. We see that there are some significant differences among capture type. I uh, used a ticky test and found that that the uh, dip net captures were smaller than fike and hand captures, and sand captures were significantly smaller than fike captures. Uh, in 2020, we started using fikes with slightly smaller one and a half inch mesh um, to allow for the capture of uh, smaller individuals, and it works. Uh, you can see we're getting plenty of juveniles now. Uh, the goal is equal catchability so, so that we can uh, better understand the population structure and population dynamics, um, the demographic structure and population dynamics. So this is a good thing. Another dawning question uh, is when should we trap? Um, in Florida, they can be active year round. In Oklahoma and Arkansas, they had a spring and early summer pattern for this Western subspecies. Uh, this is a slide for some continuing research we're doing on seasonal behavior where the warmer colors represent periods of inactivity underground and the cool colors represent aquatic activity. Um, if we look at the 2019 season, we see most activity happened between February and July, but there was never a period where all individuals were in the water. This is very similar to what we observed in the East Texas Piney Woods, but if we look at the capture success by seasonal period, we can see that even during periods where most of the telemetry individuals were in the water, the capture rate varies. The capture rate was very low in late March of 2019, even though most telemetry animals were in the water. Even though the capture rates were very low on road surveys, in some cases with limited property access, they may be the only option. Uh, this figure shows the uh, dates of all terrestrial movements over land that we documented. The peak time to see them active wandering over land was in June or, or June and July. Um, so surveying during those periods during years with normal hydrology makes the most sense. Uh, sometimes they do change estivation sites, so it's possible to uh, see them on land at any time of year. Uh, but those migrations are typically very short, you know, usually less than 50 meters. Um, getting the time of day for road and trail surveys can be difficult. Uh, we attached GPS loggers set to fire every two hours, but they had a lot of malfunctions. Uh, on some individuals, we just installed cameras above their estivation site that fired every minute. Here's a turtle leaving its estivation site. If we look at the uh, terrestrial migration start times, it looks kind of like the opposite of what you would expect a predator activity curve to look like. Um, and it indicates that you probably want your road or trail surveys centered around 11 a.m. To summarize the survey protocol portion of the study, um, trap at 14 inches deep, use unbaited fike nets, trap from late April to early June in normal years, check daily for two nights, uh, use dip nets if you can't use traps, um, most of the methods have some size bias issues and uh, we should survey roads if we have to uh, in June and July with surveys centered around 11 a.m. Now, we're still deciphering some of the seasonal information. Um, 2020 was a uh, interesting year and, and I'll discuss that more in the spatial ecology section, which we're moving to now. Uh, knowing about the shape and size of animal home ranges and movements can be important for conservation. Animal movement is typically studied on at least two temporal scales, daily activities such as mating or foraging and long term scales that look at seasonal migration, annual movements and displacement. Uh, we chose to focus on the latter because that approach can address issues like migration, dispersal and nomadism, uh, which may shed some light on the tendency for this species to uh, make long migrations over land. The distance and duration of animal movements can vary by an individual's body size, sex, or age, uh, and can be affected by both season and environmental fluctuations. In spatial ecology, we typically look at the movements and home range of individuals. Um, at its, its origin, home range was described as that the area an animal moves through during normal activities, um, quote, normal activities of uh, resource acquisition and uh, reproduction throughout its, its lifetime. 
Uh, but later broadened to include movements within and among several core areas. Uh, turtles can be long lived. And so uh, for the intents and purposes of this discussion, we're talking about what is essentially an annual home range, not a lifelong home range. Um, now, understanding the size and shape of an animal's home range can answer important questions about conservation priorities, uh, dispersal and meadow population dynamics. But uh, no single home range estimator seems to be appropriate for all species. There are often issues with unused area inclusion, extended periods at rest, and temporal autocorrelation. Um, are, are prolonged periods at rest considered normal activities? You know, do, do movements in search of hibernacula or estivation sites qualify as resource acquisition? Um, how does duration of time at rest factor into the importance of hibernacula as a spatial resource? Um, if, an, if an organism spends more time at rest than active, how does that alter the method selection process for estimating home range? You know, uh, People have tried correcting for spatial autocorrelation with the uh, Ornstein-Uhlenbeck model, the temporal velocity, or they, they've tried correcting for temporal velocity autocorrelation with the Ornstein-Uhlenbeck foraging model. And then removing repeated consecutive coordinates has been suggested. Uh, the OUF model is typically used when there's a short tracking interval with GPS loggers. And, and while that doesn't really apply to our data because we tracked at longer intervals, I thought considering temporal autocorrelation might compensate for some of that extra emphasis on the estivation sites where the uh, turtle is just sitting there for months and we have many positions with the same coordinates. Uh, prior studies uh, on the other subspecies uh, reported annual home range sizes up to 100,000 square meters, uh, individual seasonal movements up to 600 meters, use of wetland mosaics between one and nine wetlands, and then inter wetland movements between 300 and 800 meters. Uh, we wanted to inform future research research. Uh, by evaluating uh, annual home range method selection for a species that spends most of the year at rest and migrates between isolated wetlands. Uh, we wanted to know if models that incorporate temporal autocorrelation provide a good fit for the data. Uh, we wanted to relate the tracking duration and resolution or data collection frequency, if you will, to the asymptotic relationship between the number of relocations and home range size. Uh, so it's been suggested that when uh, home range sizes don't asymptote, you might be dealing with a nomadic species, which would be good to know, you know. Um, and then we wanted to know uh, how the characteristics of the landscape, the demographics of the individuals and periods of drought affect movements. Uh, so how did we do this? Uh, chicken turtles shed, unfortunately. You can see the scoots peeling off here. Uh, we epoxied radios to the turtle shells, but we'd been attaching them to the rear margin of the carapace and even though we'd used a support wire to run through the edge of the shell, they got hung up and the wires broke and stuff. Uh, we lost 13 individuals over the course of a week in 2018 because of that. Eventually we moved them to the front and they stayed on. Uh, at each position, I uh, recorded the activity status, so aquatic or terrestrial, uh, the depth if aquatic, the, the uh, coordinates, some habitat data for an ongoing study we're working on, uh, whether research activities may induce additional movements, uh, and then I flagged estivation sites so that they wouldn't, uh, so that we wouldn't mistakenly log movement where none had occurred. I tracked them every one to three days when aquatic, and every one to three weeks when they went out to estivate. Uh, we calculated the number of days monitored, the total distance traveled, mean daily distance. We can kind of look at that as an individual speed. Uh, and total net displacement, which is the distance between the point of capture and the very last position for that individual. I used SP and R to calculate these values. You can use aid habitat as well. Um, I only used individuals tracked from one aquatic season to the next uh, for all the comparisons. If assumptions were met using Shapiro tests and Bartlett tests, I used T tests. But if they weren't, then I logged transformed the values. And if they still weren't, I used Man Whitney U tests. I used a low alpha value to uh, minimize type 1 error because I performed multiple tests. You can also use other Bonferroni corrections and stuff for that. Um, I used several methods to estimate annual home range. Um, I'm not going to go through the commonly addressed drawbacks to each method here because even minimum convex polygons are still used in modern studies. 
And I wanted to see how they conform to this data specifically. Uh, for the autocorrelated kernel density estimates, I used AIC rankings to uh, determine the model of best fit for each individual. I applied these methods to two data, uh, two data sets, um, one complete set and one without repeated consecutive coordinates to see if it was if that was better, um, just because they're underground in one spot all the time. Um, for core activity areas, I kind of did the same thing, uh, but I used a third data set that was uh, that only had uh, aquatic positions because they don't mate or forage on land, right? Um, in order to determine the uh, relationships between annual home range size and the spatial characteristics of the landscape, I measured three variables for each individual. Um, the number of wetlands visited, the total summed area of all wetlands used by the individual, and then the mean pairwise distance between all wetlands visited to sort of get at wetland isolation. Um, after all the individuals that uh, shed radios in the beginning and then the ones that got eaten or wandered off property or had short-term radios, we were left with uh, 14 individuals with a full year of data. And uh, two of those were adult males that wandered off site during the 2019 season. Of the seven prior that went off site, uh, two were males and five were juveniles. Um, we clocked mean daily distances up to 18 meters per day and total distance traveled up to over 10 times the longest uh, reported annual movement for the eastern subspecies. And then the total net displacement for some of these guys was huge. One turtle ended up over two kilometers away from where it started. Um, I'll go ahead and cover demographic comparisons now before we get into model fit. Uh, we didn't see significant differences between the two Katy Prairie sites in spite of some uh, habitat differences in the vegetation assemblage. And we also didn't have significant differences between adult and juvenile home range or uh, movement parameters. Uh, but it should be noted that all four juveniles uh, with, with complete data sets were females that were larger than mature male size. So it's possible there are differences in smaller juveniles, uh, possible and, and likely. Um, we had similar sample size issues when comparing adult males and females, um, but I did notice that males trended higher uh, for every distance parameter and uh, annual home range model, uh, especially when we look at the total net displacement and the home range estimates. And there have been studies where they observed that male chicken turtles tend to make longer migrations over land than females. Uh, best choice varied depending on the individual. The least squares cross validation failed to minimize the mean integrated standard error for most individuals. Um, there were some individuals that had really wide confidence intervals around the AKDE sizes, uh, especially when using the foraging model. For most individuals, the 95 KDE seemed to be the most reliable model. Uh, when repeated consecutive coordinates were removed, it usually placed smaller buffers on individual estivation sites and overall provided better smoothing. Here we can see all the positions for an adult male. The minimum convex polygon includes a lot of unused area and, and probably excludes some aquatic areas that are used by the individual. The 95 KDE maybe conforms a little better. Uh, but then removing repeated consecutive coordinates seems to take some of the emphasis off of these estivation sites. This AKDE looks reasonable, but uh, maybe a little over smoothed. Um, and then without the repeated positions, we see that the AKDE shapes are fairly similar to the KDEs for this individual. However, for individuals with larger home ranges, uh, AKDEs had some very wide confidence intervals and made these or, sort of over smooth uh, sort of egg shaped home ranges. Um, for core activity areas, uh, we tried 50% 50, 50 minimum convex polygons, which were worthless. Um, and then 50% KDEs that sometimes would neglect entire wetlands used by the individual like this one. Um, and then had the same problem with 50% AKDEs and then resorted to this 95% aquatic only data set where if we use the least squares cross validation, even if it didn't minimize error, it generated something that was closer to what the turtle probably uses for foraging. So uh, moving on to how landscape parameters affect movements. Uh, one thing I learned while following these turtles around is that uh, they tended to sort of use the entirety 
of the vegetated portions of these wetlands. So we can see here that this individual kind of used most of this wetland on the on the east uh, when it was there, but also used most of this area to the west when it was over there, um, even though this was a much larger area. This kind of made me wonder how landscape characteristics like wetland size and the distance between wetlands could affect movement parameters and home range. Um, so we tried using some linear regressions. Uh, these data violate the homoscedasticity assumptions of linear regressions, so we had to use a different approach. But just to visualize, let's look at these. So the color indicates the number of wetlands used. Um, and even though these don't meet assumptions, we can see that individuals using more wetlands tended to have larger annual home ranges, and individuals using larger wetlands tended to have larger home ranges, and then individuals using wetlands that are farther apart had larger home ranges, which is all logical. Um, we decided to use CART analysis, which uh, stands for classification and regression trees. In our case, we're using regression trees, um, but this is a uh, less assumptive multivariate process I don't want to assume too, too much with the interpretation of these trees, given the sample sizes, but we can see that there's some interaction between the influence of wetland size and isolation. If the turtles are using large enough wetlands, there's more influence from wetland size. But if they're using smaller wetlands, the level of isolation seems to have more influence on the home range size. Uh, this isn't the first time this has been documented in turtles. In a similar Australian species of Chelidina, um, which is another obligate carnivore that estivates on land and migrates from wetland to wetlands, Chelidina longicollis, um, landscape attributes had uh, more influence on spatial ecology than body size or demographic group. Um, one issue commonly discussed in home range studies is the relationship between home range size and the number of relocations or tracking duration of each individual. The idea here is that if there's an asymptotic, an asymptotic relationship, um, then you, uh, you probably collected enough data to conclude that you're estimating the individual's actual home range. Now, um, even though this study, uh, for this study, we're analyzing annual home ranges, looking at this relationship can tell us things about behavior. We can see that for most individuals using just one or two wetlands, the size is asymptote fairly quickly. Um, but for some individuals, we can see that the home ranges just keep going up and up and up. Now, this could just mean that they, uh, they have really large home ranges, or some scientists suggest that when a home range continues to increase without approaching an asymptote, the species might be nomadic. Um, two possibilities if the species is nomadic are partial nomadism, where some individuals are prone to nomadic wandering, uh, where they sort of radiate out from their place of birth, um, or eruptive nomadism, where potentially all individuals are nomadic, but nomadic behaviors are interspersed by long periods of residency. Um, we don't know which or if either of these are true, given the data at hand. It's possible that some individuals just have really large home ranges. Uh, so who cares? Why does it matter that landscape parameters influence home range estimates or whether or not the species is nomadic? Um, it matters because we need to consider these factors when designing studies applying assumptions drawn from one site to another site with different landscape parameters. And it matters because it gives us some insight into how past and current land use has impacted the movements we observe during current studies. A lot of times we assume we're dealing with normal behavior, but they're in a modified environment. You can see our Eastern Katy Prairie site in green here. Um, this imagery is from 1944. I've added the roads for reference, but you can see uh, each of these little black dots is a prairie pothole wetland. Um, and you can see that this prairie habitat even goes east of I-45 in Houston, which a lot of these areas have now grown into tallow forest or loblolly pine forest if they weren't developed. When we look at how it is now, we can see that the whole, whole landscape has changed. Here we see a closer image of where 290 and I-10 meet Loop 610, and uh, we can see that these prairie pothole wetlands were just everywhere. And today we see that the only areas that haven't been developed are attics and barker reservoirs that have grown into forests. Uh, the prairie habitat is gone. Here's a piece of 290 and Grand Parkway where we can see how vast and contiguous this prairie pothole wetland mosaic once was. 
But now we see that even the undeveloped areas don't have the wetlands. They've either been plowed through for agriculture or diverted for irrigation or uh, stock tanks. Here's one individual male in orange that made uh, long migrations over land and ended up off site. This is about two kilometers of displacement. Now consider this, if we were to keep studying this individual and had all the land access in the world, um, he kind of wouldn't have anywhere to go now. That prairie pothole mo mosaic isn't there anymore. Whereas on the landscape they evolved with, they could possibly exhibit some kind of nomadic tendencies where over a 10 year lifespan, the turtle just meanders off in random directions without having a defined home range. And could probably have gone off in any direction. The point is, when we study how these species use spatial resources, we need to consider both what they evolved with and what they have available now, because they may be different. We also need to consider current land use. This is an area where uh, once a year they tend to disc uh, the edge of this prairie parcel to the east um, and occasionally disc the whole parcel. Um, disking is a, uh, a great management practice for ground nesting birds. Um, but I always wondered how it affects chicken turtles, box turtles, and other species that estivate underground. Well, when we had two individuals esti estivating over here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's in the middle of the uh, of the eastern sort of disked portion um, or the eastern more herbaceous portion. Uh, uh, we had two turtles estivating over there. Uh, this field was disc with a shallow disc, um, and they moved over to the nearest non disc area to the west. So they basically moved to roughly that fence line. Um, they, uh, year after year, causing them to wander on land more than, uh, than they need to may cause increased predation. And uh, Danielle Walkup found this dead one in a strip that had been disced. Uh, so it's important to understand that current land use, such as plowing, disking, and mowing, can alter their movements. Uh, we also have this marked individual alive in that same area with a split right down the middle. Um, I know that stuff is sad. I'll move on to drought response. Uh, in 2020, we got a unique opportunity. Uh, the winter of 2019 had little rainfall at our sites, um, but the situation was a little different between the two Katy Prairie sites and the site in the East Texas Piney Woods. We, uh, we learned really quick that drought can affect movement in several ways. It can shrink the activity period or for one site, make it non-existent, um, and it can move the activity period around. It can bias annual home range sizes because if you have minimal movement, you also have a smaller home range um, and it can have an interesting shifting effect on the activity area. Since we were focused on sort of the potential home range sizes, we did not include uh, this 2020 data because for some sites they were, uh, you know, in, in home range estimates because for some sites they were, uh, uh, they didn't move at all. They just stayed underground in the same spots. Um, at the Katy Prairie uh, sites in 2020, we never got enough water during what we had kind of deciphered was that activity season uh, to trap them in Texas. Um, we had left dying radios on, but had cut support wires so that they could shed the radios. So we were able to find five individuals we could get to and then continued monitoring three offsite individuals through triangulation, so eight total. Um, at one site, there was never enough water to initiate activity, uh, so they're still underground now, and, and they'll probably, uh, well, <laughs> I've made this slide a while back. Uh, they skipped 2020 entirely. Um, at the other Katy Perry site, they suddenly got six inches of rain in September, uh, so all four individuals over there were active. Um, this is the first we know of that anyone has documented fall activity uh, for the, the Western subspecies fall aquatic activity uh, in mass. Um, our falls are typically dry. Um, we don't know if, if you have a wet spring and a wet fall, if they would be active in both, but hopefully we'll see in future years. Um, in the East Texas Piney Woods, we had a different experience. Uh, remember that chicken turtles prefer these shallow vegetated wetlands uh, well, at the East Texas site, the way the wetlands are constructed for waterfowl management makes for some interesting dynamics. In 2019, we caught all the chicken turtles over here. Um, in 2020, they had a drought, but not as bad as at Katy Prairie. And during the period we predicted should have the highest number of captures, which was late April and early May, uh, 
the wetland looked more like this and, and we did a session where we only caught one individual. So most of them were possibly underground. Uh, move forward a month into June and the wetland had dried down to a point where this section was now shallow enough for vegetation to grow and closer to that preferred depth. And we had 63 captures of somewhere around 50 individuals. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that even a minor drought can cause an entire activity area to shift. In 2019, all the chicken turtles seemed to be active over here in this purple section, but in 2020, they were active over here. Um, in this yellow section. So it, there were some interesting uh, spatial dynamics to these weird drought years um, that are important to consider, especially when comparing them to normal years. We left all of the 2020 data out of our uh, comparisons. Um, so in summary, uh, use unbaited fike nets uh, if you have property access for multiple days. Uh, baited hoop nets are inconsistent regionally and seem to be uh, somewhat regionally dependent. They do seem to work in certain areas. Um, fikes seem to capture fairly even demographics uh, and using slightly smaller mesh uh, it can be more even. Um, deploy traps and, and perform surveys as close to 14 inches in depth as possible. Uh, also check traps daily and leave them out for two, two nights. Um, if you have uh, if you have to use active surveys just to document presence, dip net surveys are recommended. Um, aquatic trapping and surveys should be done from, from late April to early June in years with normal hydrology, uh, but drought years may be different. Uh, road and trail surveys are not recommended due to low success rates, but if it's the only option, we recommend surveys in June and July uh, with surveys centered around 11 a.m. Uh, when designing feature studies on chicken turtle spatial ecology or other species that live in wetland mosaics and spend most of the year estimating, we recommend the 95% the kernel density estimates. Um, the long distance movements interrupted by periods of residency could indicate several behavioral possibilities for this species, including eruptive nomadism, partial nomadism, or very large resident ranges. In order to determine which behavioral description is applicable uh, and better understand the metapopulation dynamics, future studies should prioritize study duration over relocation frequency. Landscape characteristics have a relationship with movement behavior and home range size. And until the effect of landscape parameters can be studied in depth, um, studies on chicken turtle spatial ecology should be designed to include multiple sites that represent multiple populations I recommend occupied sites that have different landscape characteristics in order to observe the range of movement behaviors exhibited by the species. When making decisions about conservation and habitat management, the longevity of the species should be considered. I estimated home ranges to be as high as four and a half square uh, kilometers, but individual home ranges could be much larger over the course of a decade or much smaller during drought years. For the future, um, we're doing some continued mark and recapture trapping as, uh, as well as a re reproductive study to understand some of the population dynamics. Um, but we've also designed a floating camera trap apparatus to study basking behavior and seasonality, and uh, it works. Uh, we get a lot of red-eared sliders, but there are a few chicken turtles in here as well. Um, we also prioritize outreach. I would guess that most of the chicken turtles in Texas are on private land and, and probably many of the sites are managed for waterfowl. Uh, so networking with TPWD biologists so that they can disseminate the information to the public uh, has been a priority. Um, there are way too many people to thank. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Hey, Brandon, good stuff, man. Um, there are some questions in the chat, yes. Uh, we've got a couple, so I'll start at the beginning. Um, Dave Ligon asked uh, about the picture at the start of your presentation about the, it looked like there was a big uh, handful of invertebrates, maybe in a bucket. He was curious if that was an actual stomach sample or if that was just kind of a, you know, like a dip net sample or something. Yeah, that was just one scoop of a dip net that I, I felt like, <laughs> I felt like taking a photo of. Um, I will say if you drag a dip net through these wetlands, they, it will not always look like that, but that was a particularly, uh, particularly buggy uh, wetland. Um, but yeah, that's, we haven't done, um, 
we haven't done any kind of uh, we've we've collected, you know, a handful of fecal samples, but we try not to, you know, normally, if you're going to do diet stuff, um, you're going to, you're going to put them in a bucket and wait for them to um, evacuate their, their bowels um, and then uh, sift through the, the remains. But um, we were trying not to uh, leave them. Um, we we're trying not to keep hold them for very long. Basically, we wanted to get radios on them and get them back out. So, um, we didn't do anything with diet. Um, so, and we, we weren't sacrificing individuals, so we didn't, uh, we didn't get any gut contents or anything like that. Great. Thanks. Uh, Day also asks, um, what time of year were you not catching chicken turtles in baited traps and might there be a seasonal effect? There could be a seasonal effect, but um, most of that, most of that 2015 trapping was during, uh, and it was these same wetlands where we now catch a lot of chicken turtles. Um, the uh, it was the same time of year, and the other thing, you know, looking back, you'd kind of consider well, were those drier periods, but the the wetland depths were similar to. Uh, how they were in 2018 and 2019. Um, and so I think, you know, Donald, um, one of Dave's students um, had mentioned that maybe, maybe some of these places where they are getting them in baited traps, they're, uh, you know, they're, the bait is attracting a bunch of crawfish and then the trap, the, the crawfish are attracting the uh, chicken turtles. Um, but yeah, we had, we had a lot of, <laughs> Had a lot of hoop nets uh, with a lot of bait uh, in these uh, same wetlands in 2015, and and weren't catching them. So um, when we started using fike, you know, the when we started using fikes, we we caught one almost right away. So cool. And another question from Day: uh, Can you comment on moving traps versus saturating wetlands with traps? Or do you expect both approaches to be equally equivalent, presuming the you know for occupancy and abundance estimates? That that's a good question um, because we did see that the the capture rate tends to drop. You know, like I was saying, it it tends to drop by about half after two days, um, and. Typically, our approach now, because we have we have ongoing studies, we're still studying chicken turtles. Um, typically, our approach now is to saturate the heck out of the wetland um, for for two days, so two trap nights, three day, three person days, I guess. Um, but uh, and then and then pull all the traps at once. But that is a good question. You know, if you were to within one wetland saturate it go two days and then move them to slightly different spots. Um, I don't know if that would, if that would change things or not, um, because I, I don't know what's actually driving it. I mean, it could be um, trap shyness because chicken turtle ends up in a trap. It probably doesn't love being in the trap and then it probably doesn't love being handled. Um, and so even though we, you know, we capture them and we try to, process them and get them back in the water as quick as we can, uh, it, there seems to be some kind of trap shyness going on. Because the same number of chicken turtles is in the water on night three as there was during night one. But on night three, the capture, capture rate is much lower. And so he may have a point there. You may be able to just, uh, you may be able to just move them around. And if they're in different spots, maybe the turtles will go back in. Oh, great. Uh, another question here was estivation correlated to water temperature depth availability during the summer, or do they estivate even when conditions for uh, presumably aquatic activity exist? It seems to be related to water. Um, and I don't know if um, I might, you might be able to see it on the. Oh, no, can't get back to that. I'll have to go wait. Well, you might be able to see it here. Um, so in 2018, you can see there's this warm period. By warm, I mean warm colors, which is an estivation period. Um, where most of the adults uh, went out and estivated midsummer, that was during a particularly dry period. 
Um, and then what this later on when the wetlands really started or start later on the, uh, in 2018, we got a ton of rain and all the adults went back to the wetlands. But then as the wetlands gradually dried up for the fall, uh, or, you know, before the, fall, before the fall, all of the individuals, even the juveniles went out to estivate. So it does seem to be related to, uh, to uh, availability. And I don't, you know, at all is on, you had some drought conditions. It may not even be necessarily drought conditions or rainfall. It may be uh, availability of suitable foraging habitat. So it may be that if there's a period where, you know, where there's a bunch of super deep water available and there is no shallow vegetated water for them to forage in, and they might go estivate then. Um, that seems to be the case over at Olazon. Um, and so it, it may not be so much rainfall dependent or even drought dependent as, uh, as maybe, uh, you know, it, it may, may be that depth availability that matters. It may be that if you were to somehow create a wetland that was like stairs or like this really gently sloping giant wetland, um, it may be that when there are uh, periods where there's, you know, a foot of water with a bunch of plants in it, the turtles come out. Um, but then if they're in an area where, like Katy Prairie, <clears throat> the, uh, the wetland depth, especially on the west side, seems to be more uniform. All the wetlands seem to have roughly the same depth, and so they all tend to dry and fill at the same time on the western side. And so all the turtles tend to go estivate and, and re resume activity at the same time. Um, and so uh, I suspect it, it's more related to that than simply rainfall. Um, and we have had periods where on the cameras, those estivation cameras, um, you know, you can see that the, the area that the turtle is underground is just getting hammered with rain and you'll see periods where there's like three or four inches of standing water above the turtle and just every once in a while for like weeks at a time the turtle will stick its head up and breathe um and so and wait a little bit to go back into the water um sometimes several weeks and so um i'm not sure what it is it could be that they it should it could be that they can smell that that uh you know they can, it could be that they can smell what they like, which is these shallow vegetated wetlands with lots of buggy stuff in them. Great. Um, it's a question here about the, um, about the disking that went on that caused the, the injuries. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know, was the, the disking done kind of to maintain a boundary for a prescribed fire? Uh, you know, of course, which was going to be essential <laughs> for main, main, uh, maintenance of grasslands. The question is basically like it, you know, is how how important is disking for the management of birds? Do you, like, is that something I, you know about? I think it's pretty important um, for ground nesting birds, especially. Um, you know, it can kind of stimulate forb growth and stuff. And and for some ground nesting birds, they they uh, you know, if they have like poults or fledglings running around, they need to be able to see. And so if it's like tall grass all around, that may not be as uh, easy for them. Um, but in that particular case, so where the two had moved, um, that entire that entire field gets disked um, about once a year, maybe once every two years. I know I've been out there several times when it was disked, um, freshly disked. However, that other tract, uh, to the west also has a disc strip around the boundary um, that gets gets disked every once in a while and they recently did burn that whole tract and so it's probably serving both purposes for the property to the west uh, but for the property to the east um, you know i think it's more for the uh, either for ground nesting birds or i don't know how if if disking, disking provides uh, benefits to cattle but there's an endangered sedge, that deep-rooted flat sedge, Cyperus centrarianus, that's all over those fields. And so I don't know if maybe it serves as some kind of Cyperus prevention, um, but they definitely disc those every year and not in a fire break uh, capacity. I will say, I just wanna mention, cause I don't, I can't see who's like watching this, but if there are turtle biologists watching this, 
Um, I did notice that there was a paper on Blanding's turtles recently um, that where, where they um, mentioned that sometimes they use disking and plowing uh, to create nesting habitat. And one, uh, one chicken turtle that had a functioning logger um, that was a gravid female, she just been, been through an ultrasound and had shelled eggs. Um, she, uh, she migrated away from the wetland she had been in and went to a tiny little, like a puddle practically um, and hung out there for a few days. It was maybe four feet across. Um, she hung out there for a few days and the only positions we got uh, terrestrial positions around there were in a freshly plowed field. And so it's we're, we would be making assumptions to say that she was nesting, but it is possible she moved all that way away from this wetland just to go get to that plowed soil to nest. And so it could be that disking also provides benefits in, in terms of nesting habitat. But I would think if it's, if it's, you know, chopping turtles in half, we may want to figure out, you know, whether it does more harm than good in these scenarios or whether certain times a year would be better for disking and all that. Yeah, that's a great, great point. Um, there's a comment here. It says, uh, I live on Lake Conroe and don't see the turtles for long enough to look at the characteristics. I assume they are all red eards. I would think if they're in Lake Conroe, um, I would think unless they're in one of the margins in an area that has a lot of vegetation and is kind of shallow, um, I would think that they're they're mostly red ears. But it you know if you were to find a chicken turtle in one of those areas I'm talking about, like uh, one of the little fingers or something where there's a bunch of veg and and uh, it's shallow, it, it would not be the first time that a chicken turtle has popped up in a in a big reservoir, but on the margins. Um, it's always possible. I think, you know, now with uh, cameras that have long lenses, sorry about that, uh, <laughs> alarm for a class. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> I would, it's, it's, there have been uh, occasions where they were find in the, found in the, the margins of these, these big, uh, you know, reservoirs and stuff like that. It just doesn't seem to be what they prefer. Um, but it is a good question too, during super, super, super dry periods, would they move to a big reservoir during a period where, when it's really shallow? Um, but, okay. but yeah, oh, so, uh, sorry, I want one last thought on Lake Conrad. So if you guys are out there looking for chicken turtles, um, you know, we, we use spotting scopes and, and, uh, binoculars and all that stuff. They bask a lot. We know that now we have thousands of uh, observations of them basking with these cameras. But um, uh, I recommend cameras. Um, if you can get a camera, there are cheaper point and shoot cameras now that have long, you know, long, zoom, you know, you can zoom in really far um, and stuff like that. Uh, a slightly non-artistic, maybe a little blurry picture of a chicken turtle, um, you know, is better than Hey, you know, I saw when I think it was a chicken turtle, but I can't remember exactly what it looked like. And so um, I recommend uh, birding, birding lenses or uh, point and shoot cameras that zoom in really far over spotting scopes and binoculars. Sorry. So we have, we have a, no, it's all right, man. This is great. We have, uh, I think, about three or four more questions. Do you have time or do you have to go to, you have to, nope. Duck out? No, I have no. time. Okay, great. So next question is, at what times and under what conditions do you find dip netting to be successful? You know, <laughs> it's funny. I wish I, I wish I knew that because that I feel like that was the most very, you know, like I would just dip net opportunistically and, and record my start and end time. And, uh, you know, I've caught them at night dip netting. I've caught them, you know, in the heat of day dip netting. And uh, I think, and this is an area where this is a question I've had myself sort of, given that having fight traps in the water doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to catch chicken turtles because we've had fikes in the water when there are chicken turtles with radios on all around them and not going in the, the traps. It may be 
be that during the earlier part of the year where it's a little cooler, but they're in the water, um, that may be the best time to dip net just because I would think they don't have anywhere to go. So if, if they're in the water and they're not very active, I would think your saning and dip net surveys would, would yield higher uh, captures um, saning too. Um, I would think during the cooler period, but when the wetlands are full, so, you know, like March, that time of year. That's great. Uh, do the anthropogenic barriers define the turtles home and seasonal ranges, or is it specific to just the seasonal? So, I don't know if uh, I asked sorry, that. Can you, yeah, can yeah. You do, define... so, do the anthropogenic barriers define the turtles? Um, home and seasonal ranges or is it just specific to the seasonal i think i'm trying to think about how that question is um i don't think i haven't seen any scenario at these sites where there where anthropogenic barriers affected them at all i'm sure they do i'm sure like we you know i'm sure to some degree going through and knocking all the wetlands out on adjacent properties probably does restrict their home ranges a little bit, um, but roads and things like that didn't see, it seemed like they were crossing roads quite a bit. Um, and then restricting their seasonal, um, their seasonal ranges, I don't think, uh, I don't know that there is any kind of anthropogenic boundary on those seasons, unless someone for rice agriculture pumps a bunch of water. We did have that happen one time. We're out of season. Um, there was a rice ag, um, you know, plot on a different property. There was a, a cell that they flood for rice and that during a dry, during 2020, um, it was super dry. So they brought water in. And uh, in that case, we did, there was one chicken turtle that became active and, and, uh, ended up being a roadkill, but, um, that was on a, you know, on private property. Uh, I think, um, I'm trying to think of a scenario where an anthropogenic barrier, um, would restrict their home ranges. And I think it's, it's not so much barriers as it is anthropogenic land use practices that make it so there's no place for them to go because there's no there's no reason for them to go over there that kind of thing if that makes sense yeah yeah that's good um did you get to compare traditional fight nets versus the drift fence and hoop trap technique uh well so with turtle trapping usually when they talk about fight nets they're they're citing vote um where it is a the traditional fight trap is a same net um, with a hoop net on both in, both or either ends. Um, with I know of other kinds of fights that are typically used for for fishing, and a lot of times you use them in rivers and things like that. The problem with those is that I you know I had a little bit of a of inside information because I had been capturing them by hand and putting radios on them, um, and so I was following chicken turtles around. It seems like when they're foraging after dusk. They tend to cruise around like a kind of sternin or a sternothrus, a, a mud turtle or musk turtle, where they're cruising around along the bottom. And most of those, uh, <clears throat> most of those um, fikes that you set up in streams and stuff like that, that are more rectangular, um, you don't really anchor them into the substrate. And so, with the same, the advantage is they typically come with weights, and so you can bury them. Um, and so, I didn't even. I didn't even try um, the large rectangular fike nets. Okay. Any chance of a Western chicken turtle in central Texas? Oh, um, I think so. There, there's a record that's incorrectly geolocated that'll pop up if you download GBIF data or, uh, or, um, uh, vertnet data, that kind of thing. But um, there is an old county record from Williamson County, so east of Taylor, um, you know, so it's sort of the western part of the Blackland Prairie. Um, there's an old county record from 
Williamson County uh, that doesn't have actual date, you know, it just says Williamson County. And I believe that one's probably from Williamson County, um, you know, and, and that would be the furthest west. And then southwest, I think between, maybe between like Edna and Yoakum might be the furthest southwest. But yeah, I don't think you're going to find chicken turtles on the, uh, on the Edwards Plateau or anything. Okay, great. And then the last question, Brennan, is there any suggestion that they can utilize rice fields since they're shallow, seasonally flooded, grassy wetlands in quotations there in those last two words? I've thought about that one a lot. Um, I've <laughs> thought about that one a whole lot. Um, I almost don't want to say, you know, I, you, I can't say one way or the other, but, um, in this Katy Prairie region where they seem to be doing, you know, it, it, I, I don't even know if they're doing well because there's we don't have data from, you know, 50 years ago to compare, but where they seem to be doing maybe a little better than other parts of the state, um, there is a lot of rice agriculture. And uh, the, the first one we found in 2015 was, you know, adjacent to a rice field that had recently been, have been filled. Um, I think that one was recently filled via rain, but, um, and then in 2020, we had a dead one moving toward a, uh, a, uh, a rice cell where someone had pumped water in. Um, and so I think it's possible that it's definitely possible they'll use them. Um, I just don't know. I'm not sure how comparable, um, a rice cell is to an actual prairie pothole wetland. Um, and so I also have to wonder, um, you know, if you were to take an area with just homogenous rice cells, you know, like a huge area, we have some counties sort of southwest of Houston where it's just rice everywhere. In those scenarios, um, it seems like there's not anywhere for the turtles to estivate. And so that may be an issue too.